open our Bibles together to Ephesians chapter 5. This morning we will look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. I'm going to begin reading verse 15 to catch the context. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So read the words of the living God. So this morning, as you probably have gathered, we're going to talk about marriage. It's in the text. It's one of my favorite subjects, favorite things to talk about. Uh, Some of you sitting here this morning are not married. Maybe you've been married. Maybe you're hoping to be married. Maybe you don't want to get married or some other option. And you may think, oh, great, here we go again. Doug's going to get up there and talk about husbands, talk about wives. This means nothing to me. Wrong. It does mean something for you. It means something for all of us. Certainly for those of us who are married, there is direct application to our roles as husbands and wives. But you know and I know how marriage is under attack in our culture. Uh, The world, the media, the government, they're all trying to eliminate distinctions between men and women, husbands and wives, and they are trying to redefine, reshape marriage itself. That is not okay. This is not a governmental relationship. This is not a civil union. God designed marriage for a very specific purpose. So regardless of whether or not we have direct application as husbands and wives, we all should care about this because God cares about it. And we need to tell the world that doesn't understand what marriage is, we need to tell them what marriage is without fear, without shame, without reservation. We need to hold to these truths that matters to God, as I'm going to show you as we go through here today. So for all of us, it applies. For some of this, Paul is going to get in our kitchen a little bit, step on our toes, and uh, make us a little uncomfortable. That's good. It's good to be uncomfortable in the Lord. All right, so the context of this, you may recall from last week, uh, Paul doesn't just shift into marriage, 
but he has, uh, he's teaching on this from the context that we, are, we looked at last week. Remember, the context is, Steve, I did my part, man. That's all you. That man you gave me. Tell me we got something. I don't know if I can do this without, without my notes. Got something? Hey, look at that. All right. There's the context. Spirit filled with Jesus. Remember, the, the, this all flows out of that statement, be filled with the Spirit. And we talked about how the filling there is the Spirit is filling us with Christ. It's another way of saying we're to grow up in Christ. We're to mature in Christ. The Spirit is working in us to make us more and more and more like Jesus. Don't be drunk with wine, he says. Don't be controlled by wine, but be controlled by the Spirit who's making you more like Jesus. That's the context. And if you remember, the technical Greek things going on, on here that are very important, I'm sure you all remember, uh, so I don't need to remind you, but I will anyway for those visitors. Uh, we've got five participles that are all explaining what it looks like for people who are filled with Jesus by the power of the Spirit. And one of them is speaking to one another through songs, which you all did very well. You can do it. You can sing loudly and speak to one another. I hope you were looking at each other. I couldn't see you because I was facing this way. But speak to one another through songs. That's one of the characteristics of being filled with the Spirit. Singing and making melody to the Lord. So there's the horizontal and there's the vertical. We sing, speak to one another. We sing to the Lord. We give thanks for how many things? All things, not most things, not the easy things, not the things we like. We give thanks for all things. That's what we do if the Spirit is filling us with Jesus. Then the fifth one is submitting to authority. Now recall in your Bibles, in my Bible too when I read it, it doesn't actually say submitting to authority. It says submit to one another. But we have to qualify this because there are people who are teaching that this verse, verse 21, means submit. Everybody submit to everybody. You can't. It's not how it works. The word itself, the word submit, implies there is someone who is in authority over you. That's how the word works. So I wanted you to grasp that, so I put it submitting to authority. This is one of the characteristics of someone who is filled with the Spirit. We submit to authority. Now, Paul's going to take the rest of chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6, and he's going to lay out three people or three groups of people who are in positions of authority. And they are husbands, parents, and masters. Three types of authority. Husbands are in a position of authority, parents are in a position of authority, and uh, masters are in a position of authority. And the submission only goes one way in all three of these relationships. Wives are to submit to their husbands. Husbands are not supposed to submit to their wives. Parents are, or children rather, to submit to the parents. Parents are not supposed to submit to their children. And slaves submit to masters. Masters don't submit to slaves. So this is how it works in the scripture, how it works in this passage. It all goes one way. So today we're going to talk about wives submitting to their husbands. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. That's the command. What are you laughing at? That's the command. Wives, submit to your husbands. So this is a really, really bad word, isn't it? I mean, are, are, are you feeling a little, are you cringing for me that I keep saying the word submission? Uh, every time I talk on this, people come up to me and say, wow, that's really brave. So it's not that brave. It's in the Bible. I didn't make this up. Okay, so I'm not defending my honor. I'm not defending my rules. Paul didn't make this up. And, and women, your husbands did not invent submission. Okay, so just like when, when you're giving birth, you can't blame your husband, it's Eve's fault. Same thing here as we will see, this is Eve's fault, and well, not entirely, but God is the one who said, wives, submit to your husbands. Paul didn't hate women, I don't hate women, nobody preaches this, well, I shouldn't hate women, this is God's command, submit. And, uh, and the world wants to do all kinds of things with the definition of submission. This is not hard. It's only hard if you don't like it, but it's not that hard. Submission, the Greek word is hupotasso. And you think, why is he on this Greek kick lately? Well, we've got a couple of Greek students here for one thing, and uh, they're behind, so they need to catch up. Uh, 
but this will help you kind of get a sense of what Paul is talking about if, if we dissect the word. So there's a root, tasso, and there's a prefix. The root tasso means to put or to place. To put or to place, simply what the word means in Greek. The prefix, hupo, means under. Ergo, that's Latin. Submit means to put or place yourself under authority. That's what the word means. Be placed, put yourself under authority. That's what Paul says. Wives, put yourself under the authority of your husband. That's how it's going to work. Now we think, uh, okay, does it really, put, put under authority. That just means uh, a wife is supposed to take his advice and, and let him take the lead, right? Wrong. I heard a gal this, this past week, uh, a, a godly young wife uh, on the internet, so she can't be wrong, right? Uh, really, a godly young wife, but, but, and she, she's done a lot of videos, which I'm going to recommend to some of you wives. She's, she's really, really great. But I, one of the videos she did, she said, now submission is not the same thing as obedience. And I paused and said, wait, what? Let me back it up. Submission is not the same thing as obedience, and then she went on to explain what she thinks submission is, and she did a fine job, but she's wrong. Submission is the same thing as obedience. If you're under the authority of someone, you kind of need to obey their authority, otherwise they don't really have any authority over you, right? If it's just suggestions, they're not your authority. And I'm not making this up. Peter also taught the very same thing as Paul, and he said this. He said, in the former times, in the Old Testament times, the holy women also, he has just said, wives be submissive to your husbands. In the former times, holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. He's just said, don't let your adornment, ladies, be the external. Don't braided hair and jewelry and, and fine dresses and all that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that shouldn't be your identity. That's not what you should be characterized by. What you should be characterized by is a gentle, quiet spirit. Thankfully, ladies, that is not the same thing as a gentle, quiet voice. You can have a really loud voice and have a gentle, quiet spirit. That's okay. Anyway, so, um, some of you are not listening to me. Okay. Uh, Uh-oh. What just happened? What just happened? Steve? Oh, thank you. Whew. The enemy is on the attack. Okay. Uh, they used to adorn themselves uh, this way, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah. What's that word, ladies? Say it louder. Obeyed. obeyed, yeah. It's right in parallel with submit. Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You're all like, is he going to go there? Is he going to go there? <laughs> Bible doesn't say you have to call your husband Lord. It just says Sarah, who was a holy woman, called her husband Lord. I'll let you draw whatever inferences you want from that. <laughs> calling him Lord, and you've become her children, women, wives. You've become her children if... You do what is right, that is, you submit to your husbands without fear. And I'm not here to preach Peter, I'm here to preach Paul, but just a side note, ladies, this is where it all counts. Your hope is in Jesus, not in your husband. <laughs> of, course, of course I got amens on that <laughs> from the wives. But why does he even bring up the idea of fear? Because being in submission to someone who has authority over you is a scary proposition. So women, your hope is not in your husband, your hope is in the capital L, Lord. If you rest there, then you can freely submit yourself to your earthly small L, Lord, and be okay because you trust Jesus, not your husband. That's the command for wives to submit, to obey their husbands. This is, this is uh, man, if the world gets a hold of this, they're going to come chasing you down because I'm going to blame you. And you're going to say, ah, oh, that man you gave us, right? Uh, submit to the authority, it's, that's what it talks about. Hus wives, submit to your husbands. Couldn't be said any plainer to what he says it over and over again. Why? And maybe more importantly, some gals are asking, how far? Ladies, would you look at verse 24, please? Look at the last word or two words of verse 24. It says, wives, submit to your husbands. Ladies, read it loud. Thank you, Barb. And how much? Okay, there's one woman. How much, ladies? How far? 
in everything. What's not included in everything? Nothing, right? Now, the one obvious exception is if a husband commands a wife to do something that God forbids, she's to obey God. Or if the husband forbids a woman to do something God commands, she's to obey God. We must always obey God rather than men. But with the exception of sin, Paul says it, in everything. That includes a lot. Now, ladies, wives, just because you don't like it does not mean he's commanding you to sin. It's important to distinguish that. Because we do funny tricks in our minds and we rationalize, well, that must be against God's command because I don't like it. No, you don't get that clause. If it's not forbidden by God, you are to submit to him. It's what he, it's what he says. This is God's command to every wife. Whether you accept it or not, this is the command. Every wife in the world is commanded to submit to their husbands. There are a lot of women in the world who have a lot of explaining to do on Judgment Day. This is a command. It's a good thing. If God designed it this way, it's a good thing. It's, it, 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 it's a blessed thing. There's a purpose behind it, as we will see. Don't rebuff this. Don't rebel against this. It's a good thing. Don't be ashamed of it. Wives, you need to stand up tall when you submit to your husband and show the world you're not ashamed of this. I mean, I can sit up here and I can preach and preach and preach and say, this is God's command, this is God's command, and of course all the women out there go, yeah, yeah, but you're a man. But when wives stand up and say, no, 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 we're not doing this because Doug told us to. <laughs> Who would do that? We're doing it because the Spirit of God told us to, because we serve Christ that means something. Do not be ashamed of this. Mothers and fathers, don't let your daughters grow up ashamed of this. The culture is trying to shame them. Don't let them, don't let them win. This is the way God designed it, and it's good. Remember the context? This is what a spirit-filled wife does. This is a characteristic of being filled with Christ you realize submission has nothing to do with dignity, right? Do you know who else submitted to authority in the Bible? Jesus. The word is used specifically about Jesus. He submitted to his parents. And he submitted to the Roman government. And he submitted to the Jewish government. And are we going to say that somehow Jesus is beneath Pilate or Joseph or Mary? That he's less dignified, that he's less, less worthy in God's eyes? Absolutely not. This has nothing to do with dignity, inherent worth, or any of those things. It's simply the way God designed it. And it's evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Jesus was the most filled, uh, Spirit-filled man to ever walk the planet, and he submitted entirely to his Father and to all whom his Father told him to submit to. It's a good thing. Who are wives to submit to? Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the culture doesn't like this. The culture doesn't like this at all. In every generation, every civilization, feminism, they didn't always call it that, but feminism has worked its way into the culture. Egalitarianism, that's the idea that men and women are not only equal in dignity, but they have to be equal in everything. They have to be equal in outcome. There should be no differences whatsoever. Uh, it's all rebellion is what it is. And you know that's what our culture is trying to do. Our culture is trying to say there is no distinction between males and females. They're trying to eradicate that. It's ludicrous. Uh, there's only two genders, folks. There are two sexes, there's two genders. That's it. And it's based on biology and chromosomes. X, Y chromosome, two X chromosomes. That's how it works. That's it. That's how God made us, male and female. And, of course, the culture wants to eradicate all of this, and we will see why as we get to the, the climax of this here in a little bit. But why? Why is this battle raged? Why have women not been willing to accept the idea that God calls them to submit? It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. 
So sometimes uh, theologians like to speculate on what the cause of Adam and Eve's sin was. You know, what was the first sin? We know the, the first real transgression was eating the fruit, but, but you know, clearly something was already amiss in their hearts. So what was that first sin? Was it pride? What was it? Well, certainly one thing that was already amiss in the garden was what happened, or I should say what didn't happen between Adam and Eve. So God gave the command, do not eat of that fruit, right? Who did he give that command to? Adam. Where was Eve at this point? Still a rib, right? She didn't exist. God says to Adam, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. On the day you eat of it, you will die. There's no woman yet. Then God creates Eve. So how is Eve supposed to know, don't eat of that fruit? Adam's supposed to tell her, right? So Eve is over there dabbling with the fruit in the general area. And the snake slithers up and says, hey, Eve, you know God is holding out on you. You can't trust God. He doesn't want you to become like him. And he knows if you eat that fruit, not you're going to die. That's a lie. He knows you're going to be like him. You should eat it. You'll become wise. It tastes good. It'll make you powerful. It'll make you like God. And she goes, oh, I want to be like God. I want to do that. And so she takes the fruit and she eats it. What's Adam doing? He's on his phone. <laughs> flipping through the sports scores. Standing wa by watching his wife disobey God. It could be argued the first sin was the neglect of a husband to protect his wife and a wife in rebellion to her husband who said, don't eat the fruit. So when God gives his punishment to Adam and Eve, and all the ones we remember, we remember now that for men, work is going to be hard, hard work. And it's not always going to be profitable work because of the sin of Adam. And for wives, when you're in pain in childbirth, again, it is not your husband's fault. It's Eve's fault. When you scream out, scream at her. But in the midst of all that judgment, God said this. He said this to Eve. Your desire will be for your husband. Now that's not what it sounds like, maybe. It's not what every husband wishes it's, it meant. What he means is, your desire will be for your husband's position. That's what the word desire here, that's what it connotes. You wife, you woman, you Eve, are going to want that role of head. And he will rule over you. Well, didn't he already rule over her? Yes, that's not what the word has a deeper connotation there. He will dominate you. He will be domineering. Talk about punishment fitting the crime. Because Adam did not exercise headship accurately and adequately over Eve, and because Eve rebelled against her husband, the entire fabric of husband-wife relationships is now in great tension and turmoil because wives don't want to submit to their husbands, and husbands either dominate their wives or neglect to lead them well. But in Christ... Everything is being transformed. In Christ, we're being renewed. In Christ, that image of God and righteousness, we've already seen earlier in chapter 4, in Christ, we're being remade. So now, wives submit to their husbands in Christ, and husbands protect and provide for their wives, as we will see. But it's been going on since Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. So he says, this is the reason, Paul says, this is the reason why wives are to submit to their husbands because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So again, whatever's out in the world eventually makes its way into the church, and as feminism has made its way into the church, this word head, headship, has been redefined. And they do all kinds of uh, linguistic gymnastics to try to make head not be an authoritative statement or an authoritative word, but to say that the fountain, women come 
from men. Men are the fountain of women. I don't even know what that means, but that's what they say. Wrong again. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has already defined for us what headship means. So husbands are the heads of their wives as Christ is the head of the church. Well, how is Christ the head of the church? This goes back to Ephesians chapter 1. Paul already defined headship for us. God seated Jesus at his right hand. That's the position of authority and power. In the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power and dominion he put all things in subjection so the whole universe is now in submission to jesus and gave him as head over all things to the church not just the fountain of all things he is the ruler he's the leader he's the power he's in the position of authority over the entire universe that's what he said after the resurrection right all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me this is what the word head means. So ladies, when it says, submit to your husband because he's your head, this is the kind of language he's using. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't apologize for it. Don't back away from it. We want to please Jesus, right? Thanks, Barb. One person wants to please Jesus. This is what we are told is headship. So husband, lead your wife. It's God's command, it's God's expectation. You represent Jesus, lead your wife. Don't be afraid, don't let the culture win this. Make decisions. Rulers, authorities, powers, they make decisions. They get stuff done. They assert themselves. Husbands, that's your job. That's your role before God. Take the initiative. Don't wait for her to suggest it. Don't wait for her to tell you it needs to be done. Take the initiative. Lead. So I talk to a lot of wives. My wife talks to a lot of wives. Beth Wall talks to a lot of wives. I hear from a lot of wives. Guys, this is what I hear in this church. I don't hear in this church a lot of wives saying, I won't submit to him. I don't hear that. Here's what I hear more than anything else. He doesn't give me anything to submit to. He doesn't lead. He doesn't make decisions. He's really good at his games, but he doesn't make any decisions. If I hear any complaints in this church, this is what I hear. That's not good enough, men. Don't be lazy like Adam. Don't be cowardly because of a a culture that's trying to shut us down. This is how God designed it. It's good. We need to lead out in these things. It's our role. It's our job. So Paul interrupts his lecture on submission. He's going to go on and talk about uh, children to parents and slaves to master. But he realizes, he knows the heart of men. He goes, huh. If I tell all these guys they're the head of their wife, and it looks like Jesus, power and dominion and authority and all that, I know what some of these guys are going to do. I am man, hear me roar, right? Kind of thing. Some of you are too young, you know what that means. (laughs) So he says, wait a minute. That's not the sum total of the relationship. So husbands, he gives a little, little excursus here, takes a little excursus to say to the husbands, The way you exercise your headship is not the way the world would tell us, and certainly not the way that feminism has explained it. It's this way. Come alongside her, there's an authoritative relationship, and there is a companion partner relationship as well. And here's the big as. Love her as Christ loves the church. When I get done with this, if you understand what Paul's saying, if we men do not realize we have the much harder job than women, then either I have failed or you haven't understood it. Think about that phrase right there. Husbands, head, authority, power, dominion. Love her as Christ loves the church. How great is that? 
How big is that? Cross? We just talked about it? That's the call of us as husbands. Love your wife as Christ loves the church. That's a huge comparison. What did Christ do? He gave up everything for us. He's not a harsh king. He's not a brow-eating king. He's not an exacting leader where we feel like demand, demand, demand. He said, I, I, I give my life for you. I did not come here to be served. He said, I came here to serve his bride. That's the example laid before us, men. Give yourself for her, husbands. So you may have noticed that my wife is not here this morning. <laughs> has nothing to do with the subject matter. <laughs> she has been gone for 12 days or something like that, maybe three weeks, 10 weeks. I don't know, it's been a long time. She took my kids to Virginia to see some dear friends out there. And I'm reminded again this week of another statement from Genesis, it is not good for a man to be alone. <laughs> my wife is a genius going, this is the longest we've been apart in 20 years. She's a genius because all it's doing is making me re realize how much I love her, how much I need her, how much I want her, how valuable she's. It's going it's to be a big celebration when she gets home tomorrow night. However, I have gotten a lot done this week. I've gotten a lot done. The stillness of the house, nobody else in the house, though it gets lonely at times, I got a lot done. I met with a lot of people I wouldn't have been able to meet with. Got writing done, got some other projects done. I was reminded again what Paul says and when he's admonishing single people to stay single. He says, because when you're single, you can spend more time devoted to the kingdom of God, but when you're married, you have to focus on worldly things. In the context there, worldly things means your wife and your kids. I got a lot done for the kingdom this week. I thought, this is what it would be like if I were single. If I, if I were married, I'd have a lot more time to get stuff done. And what I started to realize was, I do give up a lot for my wife. I've got books I want to write. I got one of them almost done this week. Got other projects I want to do. Again, I'm not sitting around. I don't, I don't play games. I don't know any games. I don't have games on my phone. I wasn't sitting around doing that. I was doing stuff that's profitable. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Please don't hear that. I'm happy to be married, I'm going to stay married, Lord willing, and, and I want her back. But I began to realize how much I could do that I like to do, that I want to do, that I can't do because I have a responsibility for a wife and kids. I played more guitar this week than I've played in 15 years probably. And that used to be my whole life was the guitar. Got all my calluses back, feels great. Husbands, we are called to give ourselves for our wives. That means there's a lot of things we might want to do, spend time on good things that we have to say no to because we are committed to being a good leader of our wives. If you're not saying no to some things, men, you're not being a good husband. You're not being a Christ-like husband. You don't get to do everything. You gave that up at the altar. You said, I will sacrifice my life for yours. doesn't mean you give her everything she wants. Jesus doesn't give me everything I want, but he gives me what I need. He takes care of me, and he gave his life for mine. That's the model. Love her. Give yourself for her. Sanctify her. Jesus sanctifies us. We husbands are to set our wives apart. We should treat them differently than we treat anybody else. In our minds, in our hearts, in our words, in our behaviors, she is special. She's different because that's how Jesus treats us. But it's not just make her feel, feel special in a, in a general sense. There's a goal here to present her glorious. That's the comparison Paul makes. Jesus is working to present us holy and blameless. He says, husbands, you love your wives like that. Our Part of our job, men, is to see that our wives grow in holiness. That's hard work. I mean, I got it easy, but some of you... Somebody make sure that gets back to Krista, will you? <laughs> we have to teach them. We have to wash them with the word, the gospel. 
We have to make sure that they are surrounded in fellowship and worship and all those things. We, that's our job. You men do not get to delegate your spiritual headship to me. I am not responsible in the same way you are for the holiness of your wife. You need to take charge of your wife. You need to help her. It's a beautiful thing. His goal for all of us is that we are holy and blameless. That should be our goal as husbands for our wives. It takes time. That takes energy. It takes knowing our wife, and it means saying no to a lot of other things. Love her as your own body, he says. Men, we love our bodies. We love our bodies. When we want the third bowl of ice cream, when our body wants the third bowl of ice cream, we get the third bowl of ice cream. When we want to go run five miles to work off the third bowl of ice cream, we go run five miles. When we decide to walk most of that, we walk. We love ourselves. We take care of ourselves. Whatever we think our body needs and wants, that's what we give it. That's what Paul says. That's the standard. Take care of her the same way you take care of yourself. Because that's what Jesus does. Nourish her. This is the word for the general provision, protection, uh, the the uh, father-like, taking care of kind of thing. The word literally means to keep her warm. My very... uh, cold-bodied wife reminds me of this all the time. I'm cold. She's always cold. I got to keep her warm. She says, Paul told you to keep me warm. Get a job. Be able to provide for her. Take care of her basic needs. That's the nourishing part. And then there's the cherishing part. Just as Jesus cherishes us. He doesn't give us everything we want, but he gives us a lot. He blesses us like crazy. Every good thing, from ice cream, I don't know, I'm on a theme here, to all the big things are blessings from our Lord Jesus, from our husband. He treasures us. That's what the word means, to treasure. Husband, I dare you, this afternoon, ask your wife two questions. Number one, what do you think I cherish? See what she says. And number two, ask her, do you feel treasured by me? And wives, be honest with them. And then you say to her, I will treasure you more. I will cherish you more. I will spend the time and energy it takes to make you feel really, really valuable to me. Because Jesus has done that for the church. That's the standard. Treasure her. And it's not about you thinking you treasure her. It's about her feeling treasured. Because we tend to treasure and cherish the way we want to be cherished. The, we, we give the things we want to give. No, no, no. It's what does she need to receive? What does she want to receive? Ask her. She'll tell you. Cherish her. So Paul's giving us all this instruction. He told wives to submit. Now he's meddling in men's lives here. And then he quotes from Genesis, the, the, the first coming together of man and wife, right? And he quotes from Genesis, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. All right, yeah, that's how about marriage. That's, what, that's how marriage works. Then he makes this statement. This is a great mystery. And every husband thinks about his wife in marriage and goes, it is a great mystery. That's exactly right. No, 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 no. That's not what mystery means in the Bible, remember? What does it mean? That's right. Wait for it. Wait for it. Isn't that, isn't that perfect for today? Fireworks, you no know, 4th of July. It's all the fireworks you're going to get this week. Mystery is something that was hidden but now has been revealed. He's been talking about this mystery all the way through. The mystery of God's plan to bring everything under the headship of Christ. The mystery that now that he's done that, we are declaring to the, to the, the angelic beings and to the whole world that Jesus is Lord, that he, he's the rule of the universe. He's going to use it again in chapter 6. The mystery here, he says, I'm quoting Genesis. I'm telling you, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They shall become one flesh. What was hidden about that statement that has now been revealed is he's talking about Christ and the church. What this means is when God created Adam and Eve and brought them together as husband and wife, he was not primarily establishing the foundation of the family or of civilization. 
That's the way we think. That's the way apologists argue. We have to preserve marriage because it's the foundation of the family, and the, fa- and the family is the nucleus of civilization. That's true. That's not the biblical argument anywhere. The reason marriage is so precious to God is because it's a picture of Jesus and his bride. So when God, in in eternity past, before God ever created Adam and Eve, he had the plan of redemption. He had the, 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 the whole concept of Jesus coming to earth to give his life on the cross to atone for our sins, to bring forgiveness. That he would have a people who would serve him and submit to him. That plan was formulated, and before he ever made human beings, he said, we're going to give them a picture. He created Adam, and he created Eve to be that picture. Every marriage since then is a picture of Christ and the church. Some are miserable pictures. Our goal is to be a good picture. Husbands, the reason you're the head of your wife is because you represent Jesus. It's not because men are smarter. It's not because men are better. It's because we have been called to represent the husband, Jesus. And wife, the reason you are to submit to your husband is not because he's better, not because he's smarter. It's because you have the privilege of representing the church. You will not submit to your husband for all eternity. I'm thankful nobody amen that. You will not submit to your husband. You will submit to Jesus for all eternity. In the next age, there's no marriage. This is a temporary picture of Christ in the church. And when a husband is a poor head of his wife, he distorts the image of Christ. He lies to the world about who Jesus is. If we're lazy, if we abdicate, if we neglect our responsibility, or if we're harsh, And unbending, we give a terrible picture of Jesus. Yes, he's the authority, but he's kind and gracious and gentle and good. And wives, every time you don't submit to your husband, you give a horrible picture of the church. You lie to the world about our collective response to Jesus. This is why sexual sin is so offensive to God whether it's premarital sex, whether it's adultery, whether it's same sex, Jesus didn't take a groom. He took a bride. He took one bride forever, and he didn't enjoy intimacy with her until he made a covenant with her. This is why God gets so upset at sexual sin. One man, one woman, the rest of our life, that's the picture. We have to hold this in high esteem, especially in our culture. We have to be courageous because we're going to be called all kinds of names. We have to be bold and say, yeah, I don't care what you say. I care what Jesus says. And this is what Jesus tells me to do and how he tells me to think about marriage. And for those of us who are married, let us remember, this is good because God designed it this way. 26 years, it'll be 27 years for me in August. You wives can learn a lot from my wife about submission. She's the best. And we can both tell you our relationship is is beautiful. It's wonderful because this is how God designed it. And to to any degree that you are falling short in this, change. The Spirit of God is capable of changing. Husbands and wives, seek him, be transformed by him, and show the world this kind of relationship. All the promises of God, all the mysteries of God, all the blessings of God, everything he's doing finds its yes in Jesus, including the relationship between husband and wife. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we live in a world where the enemy is once again seeking to turn things on its head. He's done a pretty good job in our country. Uh, 
Uh, but we don't care what the world says, and we are not here to submit to the culture. We honor Jesus. So I pray for the husbands and wives who are currently husbands and wives, or those who will be someday. Make us all great pictures of Christ in the church. And for those who are unmarried and who will stay unmarried, may they be bold and proclaim the truth of marriage as you have defined it. Give us grace where we fall short, because we will. Give us the power of your spirit to get better. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.